right, let's move on, please. Uniform circular motion. Let's do the following review, please. We know that the velocity of an object is defined as the rate of change of the position. Two, so we know that the acceleration, the instantaneous acceleration, is given by dv over dt. Three, we know that momentum p is equal to mv. And four, Newton's first law states that if the sum of f external is equal to zero, then the change in momentum will be equal to zero. Five, Newton's second law states that the sum of all external force acting on a system is, the rate at, is equal to the rate at which the momentum of that system changes. Now this gives us two expressions. F net is equal to MA. This is used when M is constant and uh, F net equal to rho A V squared and this is used when V is constant but M is changing. Now um, today the lesson that we are going to pop into will rely totally on these um, six statements. But it is worthwhile for you to understand that an object accelerates if its velocity does what? Changes. Now the velocity of an object can change in three ways. One, if the magnitude of the velocity changes but the direction <coughs> remains the same. For example, a car speeding in a what? In a straight horizontal road. Two, if the magnitude remains the same but the direction changes. For example, an object moving around in what? In a uniform circle. And three, if both the magnitude and the direction is what? Changing. For example, a projectile what? Motion. So there are three ways by which an object can be accelerated. Now we have talked about, this, we have analyzed a situation where the magnitude changes but the direction remains the same like cars accelerating along what? A straight road. We have analyzed a situation where both the magnitude and the direction changes such as in a projectile motion, we are about to analyze the situation in which the magnitude stays the same, but the direction changes. So let's consider an object moving in a circle of radius r. When the object is at this position a, its velocity is va. When the object is at this position b, its velocity is VB. When the object is at position C, its velocity is in that direction VC. And when the object is at position D, its velocity here is VD. Now, what you need to realize is for, an, for this object to move in this uniform circle, the magnitude of the velocity at A must be equal to the magnitude of the velocity at B, which must be equal to the magnitude of the velocity at C, which must be equal to the magnitude of the velocity at D. In other words, the speed of the object around the circle does not change. But as you can see, the direction of what? Of the object is changing. And because the direction is changing, remember, Velocity is equal to speed plus what? Direction. Now the speed is constant, but the direction changes. And if any of these changes, what happens? The velocity changes. Now look up everybody. Listen carefully please. The velocity can change if the speed changes or the direction changes or both the speed and the direction changes. Now, in this situation, the speed of the object moving around the circle is the same, but the direction is changing, which means that the velocity is changing. As long as the velocity changes, the object accelerates. This is important because if the object accelerates in <coughs> accordance with Newton's first law of motion, there must be what? An, a net external force acting on what? On that object. And by Newton's second law, 
the direction of the net external force is the same as the direction of what? The acceleration. Comprende? So the object accelerates because the direction of the velocity continually changes as the object is moving around in the circular path. So now, let us try to find out the direction of the acceleration. We know that the average acceleration is equal to the change in velocity divided by the change in time. Now, we also know that the change in time is always positive. This therefore implies that the direction of acceleration is the same as what? The direction of the change in velocity. Do you get me? The direction of acceleration is the same as the direction of what? The change in velocity. Good. If that is being now, look up everybody. Look up. If we have an object at position A, and then after a brief period, the object moves on to a second position. This is V2. The object initially is at this position. This is V1. Then we know that the change in velocity is equal to V final, which is V2 minus V1. This can be rewritten as V2 plus minus V1. So this is the change in velocity. So how do we represent this vectorially? Now, look at these diagrams. We have V2 is approximately like that. Watch carefully, please. This is V2. V1 is approximately like this, but negative V1, all we have to do is do what? Reverse the arrows, right? And if we reverse the arrow, remember when you are adding two vectors, graphically, what happened? You place the tail of the second vector on the head of what? The first vector. So V2 will be like that, and the resultant will be from the tail of the first to the head of what? This will be our resultant. So this is negative V1, and this is delta V. What do you realize? That delta V is pointing towards what? Center. Towards the center. So vectorially, we have shown that delta V is pointing towards the center of the circle. What does this mean? It implies that the acceleration of the object is pointing towards the center of the circle. By Newton's second law, the net force acting on the object must also be pointing towards the center of what? The circle. And this force, because it's always pointing towards the center of the circle, it is known as the centripetal force. Because the acceleration is always pointing towards the center of the circle, it's known as what? The centripetal acceleration. I'm going to prove to you that the centripetal force and the centripetal acceleration are a constant for a given what? Circle. Let me say that again. It's a constant for a given circle. It cannot change. Otherwise, the circle will become an eclipse. And that can easily be shown. Um, let's look at this question. Question number two. Let's say we have circular tube like this and we roll a ball inside this tube when the ball emerges from the tube there are three possible paths it can take it can either just go straight it could go through that path or it can take that path so this is A B C which path will the ball take? Please tune in. Assuming there is no friction.
board for a little bit. It's always out. Yeah. 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 All right, I'm ending the vote now, please. Okay, um, let's see. Interesting. 22% of the class feel that the ball will follow part A, and 78% feel the ball will follow part B. So the class is between A or B, but the right answer is B. <laughs> Why is the right answer B? out to the other end, there's nothing pushing it that way anymore. There's no wall to hit. So it's just going to have the same velocity as it did at the very end in the two bends, right? Okay. Listen. Listen. This is, this is an important illustration of how Newton's first law of motion work. Newton's first law states that in the absence of what? A net external force the velocity of the object does not change. In other words, in the absence of a net external force, the object will continue moving in the wide, in a straight line. You understand that, right? So when the object is inside the tube, there is a, ex there is a net force acting on the object towards the center. And that force is the force that is responsible to keep the object moving in a circular path. The moment it pops out of the tube, there is no net force acting on the object, and by Newton's first law, it keeps on moving in a straight line. Yes, please? What if you thought that it was like this, and that gravity would make it complete, like, an arc shape? Remember that this oh. is, this object is like on a table. The thing is, if, if, the, if the tube was vertical, and when it gets, if it's vertical, not horizontal, when it gets out of the tube, gravity will be acting downward, which will push the object toward to be falling vertically in a projectile path. But in this case, the tube is horizontal, lying on a flat tabletop like this. If we have an object moving in a circular path, let's say, let me divide this up into four quadrants. The object is at this point. Initially, the object is at rest at this point. Now the radius of the circular part is r, and the object subtains an angle theta with the x-axis. This is the y-axis. Look up. V is defined as dx over dt. What this means is that, according to the rules of calculus, V will always be perpendicular, a tangent to the point, to the path. Do you understand that? V is the slope of a position time graph. Now, the slope is a tangent at a particular point, which means if we have, this is X and that is T, if we have a graph, like that. Now at this point, the tangent here, the slope at this point is what? It's calculated by drawing a tangent at this point. So what this implies is, w most students can quote this, but they don't realize that by definition, this means that V is always tangent to what? to the xt graph at any point t. So this explains why if the path, if the path of the particle is circular, therefore the velocity will be what? Tangent to that, to that particular path. Great. Now I'm going to define a new quantity called angular velocity. Angular velocity omega is defined as the rate at which the angle subtended by the object at the origin changes. Let me not use vectors. Like radians per second? Yep, it's radians per second. Let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. As this object, listen up fellas, as this object moves around in a circle, the angle it subtends with the x-axis changes. 
When the object is at this location, the angle is different. The rate at which that angle changes is defined to be as what? Angular velocity. So this means that the angular displacement delta theta is simply given by the integral of omega dt from ti to what? Tf. We will use this later on in the semester, but this is important that you know. Now generally, we would see that omega average is given by delta t, sorry, delta theta over delta t, which means that omega is going to be equal to, this is theta final minus theta initial divided by t. If theta initial is zero, this would mean that theta is equal to omega t. So the angle subtended by the object with the x-axis can be represented by what? Omega multiplied by t. You recognize that this is the x-coordinate and uh, this is the y-coordinate and this angle is theta. So we could resolve the position vector of this particle into two. Um, x is equal to r cosine theta and y is equal to r sine theta which means that the position vector r is equal to what? r cosine theta i plus r sine theta j and some of you may want to write it as r bracket cosine theta i plus sine theta j now this is the position vector of the particle. Now keep in mind that the velocity vector v is given by dr all divided by what? dt. This is the definition of the velocity vector in two dimensions. And also keep in mind that theta is equal to omega t. If that is the case, then the position vector r can be rewritten as r cosine omega t i plus r sine omega t j. <coughs> Therefore, v, which is equal to dr over dt, is going to be equal to what? We can factorize out r omega bracket negative sine omega t i plus cosine omega t j. This is the velocity vector. Now, if you calculate the speed of the particle v, which is, the same, which is just the magnitude of the velocity vector, you will discover that it's going to be equal to what? r omega. Because this is r omega, the square root of what? Negative sine square omega t, uh, sorry, sine omega t plus cosine omega t all squared. This gives us the speed to be equal to what? All of this here is 1. The square root of 1 is 1, so V is equal to R omega. Now, just to review the main points, for an object, let's review the main points. For an object moving in a circular path, the position vector R of the object is given by what? R cosine omega T I plus r sine omega t j the velocity vector v is equal to negative r omega sine omega t i plus r omega cosine omega t j and the speed of the particle v is just going to be equal to r omega these are very vital um, equations. Keep in mind that theta is equal to omega t. One thing I didn't mention is that theta omega omega is no, which is known as angular velocity is a constant for a given what circle and it's measured in what? Radians per seconds. It's measured in 
radians per second. So when you say it's constant for a given circle, mm -hmm. like it means for a given circle, omega, for a given circle and a given radius, omega is constant. What do you think it's been if you change, then the radius changes. Oh, so you're talking like if you're attached on like a yeah. string, mm -hmm. and then like the faster you go, the mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay, I see what you're saying. Why is that? Look at it this way. Look at it this way. From this expression, we see that omega is equal to v over what? r. And this v here stands for what? The speed. Uh, for an object moving in a circle, the speed of the object is constant. If the speed of the object is constant, the radius is constant, it means that what? The angular velocity for that given circle must also be what? Constant. If the angular velocity changes, the radius has to do what? Change. If the angular velocity increases, the radius does what? Decreases. If the angular velocity decreases, the radius has to do what? Increase. In other words, an object in a smaller radius will spin faster or slower? Faster. Faster. And if the radius increases, it will spin slower. Now look up, everybody. And that's given a constant speed. Yep. It's kind of like getting stuff into orbit, right? Yeah, is that good? We'll have fun in gravitation. I can't wait to that topic. That's going to be fun. We'll actually study the Apollo mission. Oh, nice. The um, moon, uh, yeah. the Earth assist slingshot to the moon. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yep. Mm -hmm. And there's this funny question. What if the Earth, the middle of the Earth was empty? What would happen if you walk across a hole? What if the middle would you just the fall the straight the through? Or would you stay on top of it? Wait, like middle of the Earth, like the core, there would be no core? Mm -hmm. Or there would be an actual hole through and through? Mm -hmm. Like if there be a well, let's not waste time on it. We'll get there. <laughs> I'm, I'm just speaking your interest. Now look up, everybody. Please look up, look up, look up, look up, look up. The acceleration A, the acceleration vector A is dv over dt, which is just going to be, remember we are differentiating that. This is negative r omega squared cosine omega t negative r omega squared sine omega t now we can simplify this as negative r omega squared uh, nope we can simplify this as omega squared there's a negative sign here bracket r cosine omega t plus r sine omega t what is missing the i's and the j's this is i that is j this is i and that is j my fellow students what does this represent here what is this That's the position vector, right? Yeah. What this means is that the acceleration vector A is equal to negative omega square multiplied by what? The position vector. This is a very important equation. So the centripetal acceleration of the object is given by omega square right, R. In other words, the centripetal acceleration A is equal to omega square R is equal to omega square r. Uh, is it negative omega square? Okay. I just proved that a the acceleration vector is negative omega square r cap. And I just said the magnitude, all we need to do is drop the arrows on the sign. Okay. What does this imply? What does this negative sign stands for? 
look up here everybody please look up remember the position vector is positive when it's pointing away from what the circle so being negative it means that the centripetal acceleration is what directed towards the center do you understand that so write that down the negative sign implies the negative sign basically means A is directed towards the center. A is directed towards the center. What does this mean? Remember, from Newton's second law, the net force, net external force acting on an object is given by mass times what? The acceleration. So this means that the net force acting on this object is given by negative m omega square r. Listen to my words, and I'm going to say this intentionally. Listen to my words carefully the way I say it and always remember it the way I'm going to say it. The net force acting on the object is given by negative m omega square r bar. This net force is called the centripetal force. Why is this important the way I've said it? The centripetal force is not like tension where you could actually define it on a string. It is not a force, but a net force acting on what? An object that compiles that object to move in what? In a circle. Do you get me? That compiles that object to move in a circle. This also implies that the net force changes with situations. Let me say that again. The net force varies with different situations. So the next step is I'm going to give you different scenarios and we will calculate the net force and you will discover that it changes with what? With the context. Brian, what's funny? Sorry. Now, um, look up everybody. So are you yes. saying that that gives you the magnitude of the force but that it's just not a specific type of force? Yes. If, if, any it, different type? if you're asked to define what a centripetal force is, take for example if I say what is weight, weight is the gravitational pull of the earth on you. You understand that, right? Yeah. But if I tell you what is a centripetal force, you really cannot give me a unique definition for it. Right, without knowing the context. Mm -hmm. Because it is a net force that compiles you to move in a given circular part. Yes, please. I have a question that just came to my mind. It's like mm -hmm. maybe slightly off topic, but like, mm -hmm. say like something orbiting Earth, right? Yeah. Gravity is the force acting on it. Gravity is the net centripetal force. But what is the reaction to that? Good question. What is the reaction force? We are going to discuss that in detail. <laughs> the reaction force is the gravity of the satellite on the Earth. Now look up, everybody. Look up, please. Look up. Alex, close the laptop or the iPad. Thank you. Now, if a car, let me give an example. If a car is going through a valley, <coughs> at this particular juncture, you have two forces, mg, you have the normal force, right? This is a circle, circular path. The centripetal force, we know that the centripetal force is given by m omega square r, where r is the radius of the circle. In this case, the net force acting on the car will be n minus 1 mg. So this will be our centripetal force. You understand that, right? And all of this is going to be what? M R squared, M omega square R, which means that the normal force on the car is given by Mg plus M omega square R. So this is the normal force experienced by the car. The trick is, 
in the exam i will give this problem and some of you will still say that the normal force is a centripetal force even though the normal force is acting towards the center it is not a centripetal force do you understand that it is not a centripetal force the centripetal force in this case is the difference between n and y mg case two where if the car is going over a hill like that this is our car the normal force is acting that way the weight of the car is acting this way now this is our circular path students always will tell me that the normal force in this case is the weight which is not true the normal force in this case is given by what mg minus what n which is going to be equal to m omega square r in which case n will be equal to mg minus m omega square r so the normal force is greatest <coughs> when you're going through a valley than when you're going what over a hill do you understand that all right now the next thing which is really important that I like for us to see is this we have shown that the centripetal acceleration is given by omega square r this can still be, remember that omega is equal to v all divided by r so if we knock that in there ac will be given by v square all divided by r square multiplied by r and this will give us v square over r so another expression for the centripetal acceleration is v square over what r that gives us another expression for the centripetal acceleration hence the centripetal force i prefer to write it this way will be equal to m v square over r will be equal to m v square over r now a typical example is this is our giant earth and uh, this is a satellite in orbit around the earth now the only force acting on this satellite is what gravity, gravity which is the weight of the what the satellite and therefore the centripetal force mg will be equal to m v square over what r therefore the acceleration due to gravity in orbit is just v square over what over r where r is the radius of the orbit you understand that right where r is the radius of the orbit now on this, now let me let me show you something if we now have a spacecraft this is our spacecraft now Clement is standing in here on this spacecraft and that's the wrong direction look up everybody look up this is a this is a very very good example for me to demonstrate to you remember that the, the acceleration of this guy in orbit is equal to g which is v square over r now this is um Clement or Clement in Francais. So we have here there's a normal force acting on Clement N and uh, there is and there is the weight acting towards the earth. This is Mg. Remember the resultant force is towards the earth, right? How do we have normal force if I'm zero Remember you are standing on a spacecraft on it's like you are inside the international space station standing you are not in zero g look up please i don't want to deal with that now because that's a misconception but it's, it's what i want to prove to you look up let me explain so the net force on clement is equal to mg minus n all of this is equal to what m v square over what? r 
This would mean that the normal force on claiming is given by mg minus mv square over r. But we have just shown that g is v square over what? r. This means that n is equal to what? mv square over r minus mv square over r, which is equal to what? 0. Which means that claiming in OB does not feel any normal force on him. When this happens, we say that claiming is weightless. This explains why astronauts in orbit are what? In free fall or weightless. When an object is weightless, we say that it is in what? In free fall. Do you understand that? Now, let me clear the, let me clear the air. Weightlessness does not mean that you don't have weight. We feel our weight because of the force that our support exerts on us. That's how we feel our weight. When that force ceases to exist, we have a psychological sensation that makes us uncomfortable and to some people happy. But that psychological sensation is what we call weightlessness. You are only truly weightless only if you are completely outside the gravitational field of the Earth, which is infinite. So which means that you can only be truly weightless in two scenarios. Whether you are way off from what the universe and lonely and sad, or you are in between two planets at that particular point where the gravitational field cancels out. You understand that, right? Now, we will discuss this in detail when we get to gravitation. Now, before I go to the next example, let us review what we have done so far. We have said that for an object to move in a circular track, it must have what? A net force compiling it to move in that circular track. That net force is what we call the centripetal acceleration. Alex, you keep smiling. What are you watching in that iPad? Better close it. I'm suspecting you now. I know, right? He keeps smiling. I know. Yeah. He's actually excited for the chapel. I know, right? He's excited for the chapel. You know the chapel's on? Yeah, I'm bullying. Yeah. I heard it's going to be like more involved. I feel like Alex will get a lot out of it. <laughs> you know, bullying is bad. It's yeah, really bad. But the truth is, one thing I've found out the hard way is when life hits you hard when you're young, it's preparing you better when you get older. Because most often, get these statistics, every year, 300 million people are diagnosed clinically depressed simply because they cannot handle the vicissitudes and the challenges of life. Thus, our normal pendulum, made up of a string and a bulb, let's say the bulb is of mass M and the length is L. Now, this bulb is given a push so that it swings in a wire, a circle. So as it swings, it forms a cone. This explains why it's called a conical pendulum. It's something that you can easily reproduce. It's like you do this, right? As it swings, what happens? It forms a cone. Now look up everybody, let's analyze the situation. The very first thing when you're analyzing a situation like this is to draw a free body diagram. This is M, and there is tension in the string. This is T. Let us call that angle theta, which means that this angle here is also theta. Now the question that I have for you faithful physicists or physics students is, is there a net force? At what is the net force that is compiling the pendulum to move in a circle? Look up, everybody. Let's get let's just get 
Please pay attention. In the next test, this will be the first question. So we can resolve, we can resolve T into two components. This is T sine theta, and this will be T cosine theta. You recognize that the component of the tension in the string provides what the centripetal force. So we can faithfully say that T sine theta will be equal to mv squared all divided by what? R. R and T cosine theta will be equal to mg. Let's call this equation 1 and let's call this equation 2. If we divide equation 1 by equation 2, we will end up with something interesting. We will have the tangent of theta, all of this should be equal to um, v squared divided by what? Rg, which means that the speed of the object will be given by the square root of what? Rg, the tangent of theta. One interesting question is for us to calculate the period of revolution of the conical pendulum. Now, observe something. I'm going to do something which is not magic. We know that omega is equal to delta theta all divided by delta t. If you have an object in a circle, when that object goes around once, the total theta is equal to what? 2 pi. The time it takes for the object to go around the circle once is called what? The period. This gives us the famous equation omega is equal to 2 pi over what? Over t. t is the period. The period is the time it takes for you to go around the circle once. But the number of times you go around the circle per what? Per second is what we call the frequency. And the frequency has an interesting relationship with the period. T is equal to 1 over F, which means that omega is 2 pi F, where F is the frequency, not the angular frequency. Omega is sometimes known as the angular frequency because of this formula. And F is just the frequency. If this is the case, we know that V is equal to the square root of what? GR and theta and therefore this would mean that and we also know that V is equal to R omega this would mean that R omega is equal to what? the square root of GR the tangent of theta but what is omega? omega is 2 pi over T so this is just going to be 2 pi R divided by T equal to the square root of GR the tangent of theta. Now we need to look for the expression for T. If I go to the next slide, you will have T equal to 2 pi R divided by the square root of GR tan theta. Some of you like to keep it this way, but you know, I like to make things prettier. So this is equal to 2 pi the square root of R, R divided by G tangent of theta. This is our period. And that is our period. And this comes to the end of the class. We will do more examples next class. And that will be the end of this unit. After which you, you have an example.